Good day, grade 11. So welcome to this next lesson on physics. In this lesson, we're going to be talking about electronegativity and its influence on how things bond. So we've been talking about the shapes of molecules. We looked at covalent bonding and ionic bonding, and we looked at Lewis dot notation um, in the last couple, you know, the dot cross notation in the last couple of lessons. And now we're going to move on to electronegativity and so on and so on. The whole point about these lessons at the moment is that we're looking at how things bond, why they bond in that way, and we're looking at the shapes that they make, okay? Because the way they bond actually, well, the whole point about atoms is that they, unless they are natural diatomic or if they're noble gases, they tend to bond in order to become like noble gases, right? So the point is that everything in chemistry is trying to get these atoms to bond and when they bond the way that they bond actually interferes or influences their chemistry as well so that is what we're looking at so let's talk about what electronegativity is like it's a measure of an atom's ability to attract shared pairs of electrons shared pairs of electrons okay that is the formal definition of electronegativity and yes grade 11 you have to learn it you have have to learn that this is a measure of atoms ability to attract shared pairs of electrons the higher electronegativity negativity obviously the stronger the ability to attract electrons and then obviously conversely the lower electronegativity the stronger the ability I mean the weaker the ability so in other words if you've got a high electronegativity then the atom will not only hold its own electrons close to it, but it'll pull electrons, it'll attract electrons of other atoms. Whereas if the electronegativity is very low, it'll happily give its electrons away, happily. Okay, so in general, metals have a lower electronegativities and non-metals then obviously have a higher electronegativities. So if you look at this, this is the periodic table. And if you look at it, it's a little bit different from the way that it normally appears to you for the simple reason that the electronegativity numbers are um, quite obvious okay so it's called the table of Pauling electronegativity um, values because Pauling came up with a table there were a whole bunch of different people that came up with different versions of the electronegativity table a bit like Dimitri Mendeleev and his periodic table okay but Pauling was the one who went along and said, okay, fine, let's make fluorine, which is the most electronegative of all the atoms that we know about so far, let's make that have a value of four, okay? And then what we're going to do is we can compare every other atom on the periodic table with fluorine, okay? So fluorine was designated the value four, Okay, which has the highest electronegativity, which means it is the strongest when it comes to attracting elect shared electron pairs, okay, or electrons. And as you can see over here, francium and cesium have the lowest electronegativities. And they range obviously from 0.7 up to 4. Okay, so, and it, basically you'll notice as well is that. Okay, well, we'll talk about it in a second. Um, is that there is a, tr a direction, a trait as to what this, what, how the electronegativities work. Okay, so that was basically it. Dear old Mr. Pauling decided on this being number four and then rated everything on the periodic table with respect to it. Okay, but diatomic molecules are identical and have identical electronegativities okay so therefore they form non-polar bonds and that's very important they form non-polar bonds because remember we are talking about electronegativity with respect to bonding and the different type of bonding you get okay so the first thing you need to know about is non-polar bonds and non-polar bonds occur between things that have got identical electronegativities now there are some if you look over there there are some atoms over here that do have identical electronegativities. I mean, here is boron and that there is, what is that? It's arsenic. 
Um, not that they're going to bond. Um, let's have a look over here. Yeah, you've got boron and hydrogen. That's 2.1, that's 2, so it's basically the same thing. There's phosphorus at 2.1 and hydrogen at 2.1. So they've got identical electronegativity. So therefore, we can say that they're definitely going to form a non-polar molecule. If carbon and sulfur ever bonded, they would also form a non-polar molecule because of the fact that they both have electronegativities of 2.5. Okay, so you get it. So, as we were saying, if you've got diatomic molecules, now your diatomic molecules are, what are they? Let's just go back up again, sorry. Are your hydrogen, okay? And then it forms, let me just change a different color so I don't write over. It forms like an, um, an L shape, okay? An upside down, back to front L. Okay, there it is. Or well, seven, the very basic seven. Okay, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, acetine, and hydrogen are all diatomic molecules in nature. They're identical and have identical electronegativities. So there you go, you've got hydrogen, and you'll have to notice that there's one shared pair of electrons. Fluorine as well has got one shared pair. Um, that there would be oxygen, because it's got two pairs of electrons that are shared, okay, O2. And then they've got nitrogen with three pairs of electrons that are shared. Okay, and that's what it looks like. Obviously, these are all just different models, okay, of the actual atoms, because they don't look like solid little balls of sticks representing their bonds at all. Okay, so now let's talk about the electronegativity trends. Electronegativity increases up the groups and increases to the right across the periods in the periodic table. So it forms basically, it goes basically from bottom left to top right. And we kind of mentioned that already with fluorine being up here at no commas, sorry, being four. And this over here, cesium and francium being naught comma seven. Okay, fluorine is the highest and francium is the lowest. So you can see it goes up and across. So it is 0 0.7, 0 0.7, 0 0.8, 0 0.8, 0 0.9, 1, 1.5, 2, 2.5, 3, etc., etc. And you can see it as you go across from left to right, that goes up. Okay, so electronegativity increases as you go from left to right. Okay, so let's talk about electronegative differences. We use the difference between electronegativities of the atoms in the molecule to identify the type of bond of the molecule to classify it. Okay, so what we do is we say, okay, fine. Let's look at electronegative fluorine is four, right? And let's say the electronegative cesium is 0.7. There's cesium, 0.7. So the electronegativity difference is 3.3. Okay, it's 3.3. So the bond becomes more polar as the difference increases from 0 to 3.3. Okay, so we just said that we have perfectly non-polar bonds if the electronegativity difference is zero. Okay, the electronegativity difference is zero. Why? Because then it's perfectly, the, 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 the electrons are going to be shared equally between the molecules and that the electrons aren't going to be more attracted to one of the atoms than to the others, okay? Whereas, obviously, if you've got something like this with francium and cesium, which do not bond, but let's pretend, then this, yeah, is going to be attracting the electrons so strongly that cesium is, is so weak at holding those electrons that all those electrons are going to go onto the fluorine. So it actually becomes a very polar molecule. So there's a table of how we can classify. Now, grade 11s. Admittedly, there's a little bit of discrepancy within your textbooks. Some people, some of the textbooks will go 2.1 and then 2.1 over here, and some will go, um, yeah, one or 1.9 and 1.9 over there. Basically, doesn't really matter too much, okay? But um, as long as you get the dose that less than one is going to be covalent from one till two is polar covalent and from two up is ionic, okay? So what we're saying is that, and obviously zero alone is going to be pure covalent, pure covalent. Why? Because of the fact that there is 
no sharing of electrons or nothing okay i mean the pure sh sharing of electrons they don't the electrons don't get attracted to one side or the other and then what they do is everything above that they call non-polar covalent and then from 0 0.9 to 2 is polar covalent and 2 to 3.3 .3 is ionic. And like I said, this is some discrepancy with respect to the 2.1 and 1.9 um, with respect to certain textbooks, but it doesn't really matter because the examples I give you in the exams will obviously fall within those ranges so you don't have to stress too much. They're not going to give you something on a 2 and then go, whoa, you got it wrong, okay? you need to actually realize that they're going to give you something like 1.4 would be polar covalent if the electronegative difference was and 2.2 would be ionic or 2.3 or whatever. So let's look at an example of a polar covalent bond. For example, hydrogen chloride. And this is when there's an unequal sharing of one or more electron pairs. Okay, so if you look at hydrogen chloride, your electronegativity of hydrogen is 2.1. Okay, let's just prove that to you. Oh. I don't know what I'm doing. Let's go back. Let's just prove that to you. There you go. The electronegativity of hydrogen is 2.1. And while we're here, we're talking hydrogen chloride. So do you see the electronegative chlorine is 3? So we've got 2.1 and 3. Okay. So the electronegative chlorine is 3. Therefore, this is a polar covalent compound. How do we know that? Because the difference between them is 0, 0,9. Now, admittedly, I said to you they weren't going to do that to you, um, but it's fine. It is definitely a polar covalent bond. The molecule is called a dipole. Why is it called a dipole? Because di means two and pole means it's got two ends, okay? So if you look at this, you'll see that they've got this little delta, positive and delta negative, okay? And what happens is because the electronegativity of the chlorine is so much higher than that of the electrons, the electrons, the shared pair of electrons are pulled closer to the chlorine atom than they are to the hydrogen nucleus of that atom, okay? So what happens is these electrons are held more closely to the chlorine. So if I had to come along over here and look at my chlorine, I would see that this side of the molecule is slightly negative. And that's what this little delta, baby delta sign says. And I've told you guys this before, that big delta, okay, the big triangle delta means change in, and it's a Greek letter for D for delta. And the little letter for delta, like, you know, you've got, you know that when we write, we've got uh, big D, and then we've got little d, right? Same thing, yeah, right? Big D and baby D. So the little delta means small change. Okay, small, a little bit negative, little bit. Okay, so that's what that's showing you there. Whereas this year, because the fact that it's lost to the electrons, therefore, what's the only thing going around this or in this? It's the positive proton right in the middle. So therefore, it looks slightly positive. But please note that the whole molecule as a whole is still neutral. It's still neutral, the whole molecule, but it is has polar covalent bonds. Therefore, what happens is if I come this side, I'll see it's slightly negative. If I come this side, I'll see it's slightly positive. Now let's talk about bond energy and length because what we're going to do is after we've done a couple of these things, we need to actually then put it all together and we'll do some questions on the different types of bonding and bond energy and lens and things like that because it all comes together in one big thing. Okay, so first of all, we need to explain this to you. Okay, so what this is, is this is the distance between atomic nuclei of two different atoms. So I'm going to, I'm going to talk to you about this as I would as if you were kids in my class and using an analogy. And then I would explain to you in science terms. And the reason I do this is because I find that my students really appreciate it and they actually enjoy it and, and they remember it, which is more important to care. So what happens is over here, you have two little atoms. Okay, little one atom and two atoms. And they're quite far apart, okay? In fact, they're further apart than that. Let's move them quite far apart, okay? And they both come to this little party. Okay, yeah, they are, okay? And they see each other across the room. Their eyes meet across the room and they go, 
I mean, love, I mean, love. Okay, so they move closer and closer and closer together. So yeah, they're getting closer and closer together. And yeah, they get closer and closer together. In fact, they, but yeah, they've, they've kind of gone off to a corner. They're really spending a lot of time together, okay? Then they decide to, you know how it is when you start going out. You start, you're spending tons and tons and tons of time together. So much so that you don't have any more space yourself. You know, there's no more free time. There's no more uh, reading books when, when you want to and doing things. You just do things together all the time, okay? And you get to a point where over here, there's so much overlapping. This is like when you initial part of the relationship, right? There's so much overlapping, it's almost like unbearable. At that point, two things can happen. One, you can break up. One might lose the temper with the other and they go, that's it, broken up. But what generally happens is that you guys calm down a little bit and you one might say, well, actually, I need a night out with the girls and the other one will say, I need a night with the boys or whatever. And you move back down to a point where you actually have just the right amount of time spent together and just the right amount of space for each other and you reach a nice stable point in your relationship. Okay, it's not boring, it's just stable. Okay, so that there is the silly analogy, which my students enjoy, and like I said, and it helps them understand what's going on. Okay, now let's talk about in science terms. Okay, so in science terms, you have two atoms. They see each other across the room. No, I'm kidding. Okay, you have two atoms. And what happens is that they are moving closer together. There might be several reasons for it. One might just be the fact that they are at is kinetic energy that's bringing them closer. As they come closer and closer, there is some attraction between them. And I just want to see something. Okay, now. So what happens is you get to a point where these two atoms are quite close together. Okay. So they move close together. They get closer and closer together. Right. At this point here, they're getting closer and closer together. Okay. So they're moving closer and closer together. Not quite bonding yet. Okay. And at that point, you'll have attraction between the proton nucleus of this one attracts is attracted to the electron cloud and the electron cloud here is attracted to the proton and similarly you've got this um, electron cloud is attracted to the proton nucleus and um, this electron cloud over here is attracted to I'm going to get this right and this proton is attracted to that electron cloud. I need space. Okay, so you've got a lot of attraction happening here. Okay, then what happens is you get to this point over here. Okay, at that point, you've got basically quite a bit of symbiosis going on there. What do I mean by that? I mean as in, okay, you've again got the proton nuclei. In other words, there's nuclei with protons in them. The neutrons don't count when it comes to charge, right? So what do we have? We have, and I'm going to do this in different colors, we've got forces of repulsion between the nuclei and you've got forces of repulsion between the electron clouds, okay? They're repelling each other, but they're exactly the same. <laughs> Sorry. At exactly the same time, and like I said, this electron cloud is being attracted. This electron cloud is being attracted to the nucleus. Okay, this electron cloud over here is being attracted to this nucleus. The nucleus is being attracted to the electron cloud over here, and this nucleus is being attracted to this electron cloud. So basically, it's all beautifully balanced out. Okay, so it is in a perfect relationship. But you know how things are; they don't quite know that they're in a perfect relationship yet. So what happens is it atoms will move slightly closer together. They'll move slightly, oh, I'll draw it over here, slightly closer together. Let's see if I can get this right. Oh, gosh. I don't mean for my one atom to be bigger than the other. I'm sorry. Okay, so <laughs> mm, I thought so. Okay, so now what happens, now what happens is that you've got, again, the this is the positive nucleus here, and this is the positive nucleus here. Now, they are repelling, okay? It's quite a big repulsion. But then on top of that, you've got quite a big repulsion between the electron orbitals, okay? There's a repulsion there, there's a repulsion there. So everybody's repelling each other. So what happens is they push away, and they go back to that point where they are stable. So everything is to do with the attraction repulsion of the positive protons and your electrons, etc. So this point here is this dude here. 
where they are overlapping and there is an equal amount of attraction repulsion between the protons and the electrons. The proton nuclei, uh, I mean the proton containing nuclei and the electron shells, okay. So that there, and this bond length, the bond length is, what color can I use? I'll use green. The bond length is a distance between their nuclei. So the bond length is that distance there. It's the distance between the nuclei, all right? And the bond energy is the energy required to make or break the bond. And the reason I do that is because it takes the same amount of energy to make a bond as it does to break a bond, okay? So what you need to realize is that when I say bond energy, most people talk about it being the amount of energy required to break that bond, but it also is the same amount of energy required to make the bond. Okay, so now, good news, grade 11s. The good news is that you need to be able to draw label, explain, and do this diagram here and this one. Okay, so you need to be able to draw, label, and explain the graph, all of it. Okay, and you need to explain that here what's happening is there's so much energy being required to keep this atom together that it actually pushes it apart and gets to the lowest energy level there, which is the energy required to make or break the bond, okay? You need to be able to label, draw, and explain the graph, because they could ask you to do any and all of those. And you also need to be able, sometimes they ask you to explain using diagrams, you need to be able to draw these out. Okay, so now let's look at the definitions. So bond length is the distance between the nuclei of two adjacent atoms when they bond. Okay, as I said, the bond energy, the amount of energy that must be added to the system to break the bond has formed. Okay, so like I said as well, the definition of bond energy is the energy required to break the bond. But it works both ways. If you're making a bond, that is the amount of energy usually that is given off. Okay, and if you're breaking the bond, that is the amount of energy that's required. Okay, to break that bond. Bond strength. This is obviously how strong, strongly one atom attracts and is held to another. Okay, bond strength. So now let's talk about bond strength because this is actually pretty important. Okay, bond strength is dependent on a couple of factors. And you guys need to not only be able to um, explain the fact, state the factors, but you also need to be able to explain them. So the first thing is the bond length. Okay. So the bond strength is dependent on the bond length. Obviously, the shorter the bond length, the stronger the bond between the atoms. Okay, the shorter the bond length, the stronger the bond between the atoms. Obviously, because that means that the, the nuclei of the atoms are close together, and therefore it's going to be more difficult to break that those two atoms apart. The size of the atom, same thing really. The smaller the atom, the stronger the bond. And finally, the number of bonds. The more bonds that exist between the same atoms, the stronger the bond. Okay, now I need to explain this to you as well, grade 11, it's very important. So say for example, you know you get, you've got single bonds. Okay, let's just go like this. You've got carbon, carbon. Let's give you three molecules. And again, I'll use a little analogy and explain it to you. I don't know why I decided to put that in an angle. Okay, right. So, yeah, just in case you don't know, this is ethane, ethene, and ethine. There are three organic compounds that you will learn about in grade 12 if you haven't already learned about them. What's important about them is that ethane has got a single bond between the two carbons, ethene has got a double bond, and ethine has got a triple bond. Okay, so let me put it to you again in analogy form, okay? 
what we're saying is that the more bonds that exist between the same atoms, the stronger the bond. And that is true overall. Okay, so in other words, if I had to rate these according to the strength of the bonds between the carbon carbons, carbon and carbon, this would be the strongest, this would be the next strongest, and this would be the weakest. Okay, so the energy required to break this would be most less least okay but you need to find out you need to know about these things okay we're talking about them okay so okay the yeah, my analogy let's say for example you are constantly hanging over the side of a cliff i don't know why but you are hanging on for dear life okay and some really big stranger really big strong stranger comes along and they're mountaineer and everything else and they say it's okay, I can reach you, okay? And they grab hold of your arms and you have one foot on the on the wall, okay? So you're feeling quite secure now, don't you agree? That, okay, you're not feeling perfectly safe, but you feel like you're not going to plummet to your death, okay? You've got this big, strong person who you trust implicitly and he's holding both your arms and your one foot, your one foot has stuck, dug into a niche, okay, or um, a crevice into the, in the side of the mountain, and you're feeling safe, okay, your foot's there, everything's fine, cool. That is the equivalent of a triple bond, okay, you are fairly safe, okay, you're pretty sure that you're going to survive this, okay. Then what happens is the strong dude goes, okay, listen, you need to trust me, I want you to let go of your one your foot. I want you to um, dig it out of that crevice, okay, and just hang by your two arms, by me, holding, I'm holding you, nothing else, okay. So, do you agree it would take quite a bit of persuasion to go from a triple bond to a double bond, okay. You need to break that triple bond over there, in other words, by moving your foot off the side of the mountain and just being held by the two arms, okay. So, Okay, yes, fine. So we break that triple, the third bond. Okay, fine. Then the dude says, listen, the only way I'm going to be able to save you is if I let go of one of your hands and I swing you across. Okay, so at this point now you're starting to think, seriously, this guy must be crazy. You must be seriously mad. Okay, but you think, okay, okay, I can do this. But what happens is, do you agree it takes even a larger amount of energy and self-trust to break that second bond to go down to a single bond, which is guy holding with one hand. And yes, okay, he saves you. But the point is this, okay, if you are looking at a triple bond, okay, the way it works is this, is the third one requires the least amount of energy to break, then you go down to a double bond, and then the second bond requires, second bond, okay, requires more energy to break, okay, to break that bond, because now he's asking you to go single armed. And then you go down to single bonds, and that there is the most. So all three together, okay, will obviously require the most amount of energy to break, okay, and they're the strongest. All three together the strongest, okay. But the third one, whichever one's the third one, the third one is the easiest of the three to break because it uses the least amount of energy. Then you get the second one that requires more energy to break and then of course the first the last one by itself is the most amount of energy to break okay get it okay so now let's talk about intermolecular forces so we've spoken about bonding now let's talk about intermolecular forces now we've spoken about intramolecular forces these occur within the molecules and they're the covalent ionic and metallic bonding we've already spoken about okay now we need to talk about in intermolecular forces inter so you can also think about this that you guys know about the internet okay and the intranet 
So if you're at a fairly fancy school, they might have what is called an internet, which means that you can log on to um, the website or the network of the school and you can just communicate between laptops okay or computers and that's an intranet so with all within a company so for example if you're working for i don't know let's think about volkswagen then the volkswagen will have an intranet where they, the commuters computers connect with each other through an internal network they don't need to go out into the world wide web but if you are in i don't know sunny south africa in cape town so you're sitting in Cape Town, okay, and there's a mountain, okay, and then there is a friend of yours who's sitting up on the other side of the world with the Eiffel Tower in the background. Yeah, I know it looks like an A. Okay, right, and they're sitting with their French hat on, eating bread, baguettes in front of their laptop, and their stripy shirt. Yeah, I know, it's just terrible. Then they would use the internet. So the internet is between, between. And intra is within. Okay, so internet is between and intra is within. Okay, so the intra molecular bonds are within the molecule and they're the covalent, ionic and metallic, okay? The intermolecular forces are between the molecules and they're much weaker, much weaker. And they act over greater differences, distances than the intramolecular bonds, which makes sense because the ones inside the molecule were the other ones between the molecules. So now we're going to talk about the different types of intermolecular forces. So there are forces between ions and molecules and forces between molecules. Okay. Ions are what? Ions are positively or negatively charged atoms or molecules. I know it's usually atoms, but you also get polyatomic ions. So a polyatomic ion, for example, a polyatomic ion would be, for example, NH4 plus. Okay, so that's why I'm including molecules yeah because a polyatomic ion is actually a molecule of nitrogen and four hydrogens okay that's one of them there's also for example nitrate no3 to minus nitrite which is no3 no2 minus sulfate so4 to minus sulfite so3 minus some things like that okay so you need to know your polyatomic ions and we will go through them okay but the forces between the ions and molecules are one of the types of intermolecular forces you get and forces between molecules just between any molecules okay so for example between i don't know water and hcl okay those are the different types of intermolecular forces you get okay the forces between the molecules are called van der Waals forces and they a whole bunch of different van der Waals forces that we're going to be learning about okay and this is going to be important not only for this part of your chemistry but very important for your very very important for your organic chemistry when you cover organic chemistry next year okay and if you do it this year, that's great too. Okay, so now we're going to have a look at the different types of bonds. Okay, so the first one here is an ion dipole. This here is a positively charged ion, so therefore we can call it a cat ion. And this here is a dipole. A dipole, remember, means that it's got two poles, two poles, okay? And you will notice that, yeah, you've got the positively charged ion is attracted to the negative end of your dipole. Okay, if this had been a negatively charged ion, then this would have been a plus and that would have been a minus, right? So it's attracted to the opposite end, obviously. 
Right, next, we've got ion-induced dipole. Okay, I am going to explain this all very carefully in serious detail, but this is a good summary page. That's why I'm going to go through it. And I actually really would like to urge you guys that if you struggle with your intermolecular forces, to maybe just have a page like this for yourself, either print this out, screenshot it and print it out for yourselves, or maybe make one for yourself. Because if you understand all this, then basically your intermolecular forces are sorted. Okay, so what happens is, yeah, you have a nonpolar, a nonpolar molecule come along, okay, and it sees a really big positively charged cation, okay. What happens is all the electrons in this nonpolar molecule get attracted towards the positively charged cation. What happens then is that the electrons get pulled over and there is an attraction, an ion-induced dipole force between them. What I need to explain to you guys is that there's no actual bonding that occurs. Bonding occurs, officially bonding is when there is an, a chemical combination that occurs between two atoms or molecules. And there's no actual chemical combination happening here, okay? They come and move closer together, they may stick together for a little while, and then they move apart again. And sometimes, and you need to understand, when I say a little while, I'm talking about milliseconds we're talking about very short periods of time yeah because these are very temporary bonds and very temporary um situations okay so what happens is like i said you've got the positive cation is sitting here the electrons inside this non-polar molecule get attracted to the big positive cation over there and they all travel that way, which means that this here now looks like a dipole. It's slightly negative on the left-hand side and slightly positive on the right-hand side. Okay, and guys, it's slightly positive here because of the lack of electrons. It's not that the protons have traveled onto the right-hand side. It's just that there's a lack of electrons. So therefore, it seems slightly positive. And please note, this is called an induced dipole because we made it like that. By bringing the ion close to this nuclear, um, to this, uh, sorry, to this neutral atom, okay, you've made a dipole, okay. The next is dipole, dipole, and you can see that this is very directional, hey, very directional. In other words, it has to be so that the positive lines up with the negative and the positive lines up with the negative and the positive lines up with the negative, etc. Okay, it is very directional, okay? And all that you're seeing, as is pretty obvious, is that it only works if the dipoles come together and align so that the positive of the one end of the dipole is next to the one negative end of the other one end of the dipole and vice versa, okay? Now, we've got dipole induced dipole. So again, we've got a dipole and here we've got a non-polar, non-polar atom or molecule. Okay, well, it'll be molecule since it's a dipole. Okay, so what happens again is it happens that this dipole is sitting here and it's a proper dipole and this side is slightly negative and this side is slightly positive. This non-polar dipole comes close to this negative end of the dipole and what it does is it forces the electrons away it pushes the electrons all onto the right hand side of the molecule which leaves this looking like it is a positively charged end okay but actually just what happens is that the other side is electron rich which makes this positive okay and then what happens is there is a very brief bonding period okay or for period of attraction. Okay, then you've got what is called momentary dipoles. Okay, so let me explain this to you. So let's say you've got an atom over here with its proton nucleus, okay? And let's say you've got another atom over here. Okay. Now, let's say that we know the electrons go around this atom. So remember, that goes la, 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 la. Let's say at one point in time, the electron happens to be on this side. And I'm going to make it simple, make sure there's only one electron on this. Pretend it's a hydrogen atom. Okay. At the same time, just by luck, as this was happening and going on, this one's electron happens to be 
over here. We can on this side. Right, so what happens is, do you agree that as far as the list electron is concerned, this atom looks positive, okay? So what happens is it comes closer, it goes, ooh, look, it's positive. I find it attractive. Unfortunately, by that time, this electron over here is come back to the side. Okay, similarly, this one's electron has moved over slightly, and then there is no longer any more attraction. So this is called a momentary dipole, and momentary means temporary. Okay, it is a very temporary dipole. In fact, they say like in the moment, that's I mean like right now, now, and now, and now. It's very brief, very short, super fast, okay? That it happens to be that if the electrons are on opposite sides or the same sides of an atom at the time when they come together, then it will look to each of them that they are oppositely charged and they will allow the atoms to move close together. Okay, grade 11s, that's it for today. We will carry on talking about these types of intermolecular forces in our next lesson. Have a great day.